in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. Life in Accounting is the podcast for everyday heroes like you working in the accounting profession. Are you ready to hear from accounting influencers, thought leaders, visionaries, and other professionals leading change in the accounting world? Then stay tuned for Mark Goldman, a CPA, the owner of Where Accountants Go, and your host. Welcome to Life in Accounting. So perhaps here's where being an accountant helped. I was able to do the math in making my final Jeopardy wager. They do give you scratch paper, but no calculator. Hello, everyone. I'm Mark Goldman, the CPA and your host for Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. That clip was from Deborah Bean in Dallas, Texas. I asked Deborah to join us on the show for a few reasons. First of all, she's had a very successful career in audit, having the opportunity to work with both a national firm and a regional firm. She's going to talk to us about the initial influences that got her into the profession in the first place and how her career has progressed to her current position as director with BKD. But also, just as a little interesting twist, Deborah happens to have had a lifelong desire to be on Jeopardy. Yes, I said Jeopardy, the game show, which was fulfilled about a year ago. She's going to tell us the whole story of how that experience went in the latter half of the interview. And honestly, it's a really intriguing process. Not as easy as you may think to be able to qualify for that game show. If you enjoyed this episode, please visit our website for all our previous episodes, as well as a job board for the Texas area and links to all the prevalent certifications in the accounting world as well. That site is whereaccountantsgo.com. Once again, that's whereaccountantsgo.com. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Here's Deborah Beams, director with BKD and Jeopardy winner. Well, hello, Deborah. Thank you so much for squeezing out the time for this. I appreciate you making time for our audience. Well, hi, Mark. Thank you for having me on your show. No problem. Well, for our audience, we have Deborah Beams on the line, and we're going to delve deep into Deborah's career story, of course, like we do on all our episodes. But there's a little twist in this story at the end, though. If you have an interest in audit, this is definitely going to be a valuable episode for you. But we're also going to cover Deborah's experience being a contestant on the TV game show Jeopardy. Probably not a surprise to you, Deborah, but you're the first game show contestant that we've had on the show, at least that I'm aware of. Well, great. I look forward to talking about that experience. Let's start at the beginning, though, so we get sort of a full picture of your career. What initially led you to accounting as a possible career choice in the first place? So I was in high school and looking at colleges, thinking about majors, trying to figure out what to do with my life, basically, like a lot of high schoolers are. And I'd always loved math in school and and working with numbers. And so at one point, my mom asked me, have you thought about doing accounting? And I said, well, no, I haven't. But I, you know, started doing some looking into it and said, well, maybe I could do this. So I was in high school at White House High School in White House, Texas, which is right outside of Tyler. And we had a job shadow day. Um, during our senior year. I don't remember if it was the Chamber of Commerce or somebody that sponsored it, but we were allowed to put down, you know, what are some of the jobs you're thinking about? And then whoever was organizing this would try to find somebody for you to go shadow for a day at work. And I got assigned to shadow Kathy Kapka, who many Texas CPAs will know. She's been very active in the state society, was recently did a term as president of the Texas Society CPAs. I believe she's been on your podcast as well. And she's really was really an influential part in launching my career. At the time I shadowed her, she was the head of internal audit at UT Tyler. And so she gave me a good introduction into audit, internal audit, and the accounting profession in general. And so from there, I kind of made up my mind and declared myself an accounting major. Wow, I had no idea. I mean, I figured you knew Kathy, but I didn't realize that there was, you know, that much of a close relationship there. That's neat. That's neat. Yes, she was a guest on the podcast just last year, actually. (laughs) Interesting. How long ago was that? 
That would have been around 1999. Okay. So almost 20 years. And that was during high school for you that you were doing the shadowing? Yes. Okay. So did you go straight into college knowing that you were going to major in accounting? I did. Okay. I did. No, I wasn't always sure. There was a point, I think it was around the end of my sophomore year when I wasn't sure maybe if this was what I wanted to do. And I remember sitting down with the course catalog, which I don't know if they even print course catalogs anymore, but it was a physical book. And I was just flipping through it, going through every major and saying, well, no, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. That degree might be nice, but I don't know what to do with it. And went through the whole thing and said, nope, accounting still my best choice. There you go. Wow. Okay. Okay. Any highlights of your college experience that we should know about, you know, from a career perspective? Or did you pretty much stay on that major after that? Or? I stayed on the major. I okay. had a part-time job, the I guess, the last couple of years working as a grader for the accounting department. Okay. And one of the classes that I graded for was called professional development. It was just a one-hour class. And the weekly assignment was to find some articles on the week's topic and write a short one-page summary. And during the time that I was grading for that class, I ended up catching several instances of plagiarism Oh. in just a one-page summary, including one student who had plagiarized the ethics assignment. Wow, how ironic. So I'm curious, did that experience increase your interest in going into audit later, or did that influence your interest in audit? Because it, it appears like your career started in audit, but maybe I have that incorrect. You are correct. I've always done audit. And I suppose, I don't know if that influenced my decision or was just sort of indicative that that was the way maybe I was supposed to go. In a way, as a grader, I was already sort of auditing things, looking for errors, mistakes, things like that. Okay. Okay. I figured, obviously, the two are related. (laughs) So so what was your first job out of school? What was your first opportunity? Like a lot of accounting majors, I went straight out of school into a public accounting firm, large public accounting firm, uh, into the audit practice as an audit associate. And I suppose I had a typical kind of audit career path moving up from associate to senior associate to manager. I did take the CPA exam during my first year working out of school. I know nowadays a lot of students get to take it while they're still in school. They've got some review classes, maybe even built into their curriculum. I didn't have that option, but I was able to get it all passed within the first year, which I always like to encourage students now, get it done as soon as you can, whether it's while you're in school or very soon after, before you start losing some of what you learned in school that's maybe not part of whatever you're doing in your day job, as well as you also get out of the habit of studying regularly and test taking. Okay. Just so the listeners get an idea about how long have you been in the audit field now? I guess it's coming up on around 13 years. 13 years. Okay. What do you find the most rewarding or what have you enjoyed about it the most? Auditing is neat because you get to go out in the field to a lot of different clients. And you not only get to see how different clients do their accounting, but you also get a sense of what different companies are like, different organizations, their corporate cultures. And you really get to see some of those dynamics of from where there is good, say, tone at the top and others where there's not so much. And seeing the contrasting differences in just how these different organizations work. Now, in audit, you also get the fun pleasure of doing inventory observations, especially your first couple of years as a staff person. And some of the best audit stories come from inventory observations. So if you would let me share a couple of memorable ones from my past. Please do. (laughs) (laughs) My first year as a staff, I was assigned to do an inventory count. It was for a not-for-profit organization. It was an organization that collected, donated items and supplies that then they would hand out to needy families. And one of the items that they had the greatest quantities of was packs of diapers because families with babies need diapers, and diapers can be very expensive, and so that can be a great need. 
And so I was counting packs of diapers. And I was talking to my dad later. And I said, yeah, I had to go count diapers today. And he said, well, I'm so glad you got a master's degree in accounting so you could go count diapers. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. Another inventory count that I got to do was for a company that manufactures slot machines for casinos. And the company builds the machines and then leases them to the casinos. So they still technically own them. And so they had to send our audit staff to a couple of different casinos around the country to count the slot machines, which sounds like it's a pretty easy thing. I mean, the slot machine's kind of big. It's, you know, easy to count. Yeah. But I discovered two reasons why it wasn't. One, those casinos are laid out very confusingly, perhaps intentionally. And so I kept getting turned around and wasn't sure, wait, did I count that set or not? And the other challenge was not every slot machine in the casino was made by the company we were auditing. And so they had to help me learn to identify which slot machines belonged to that company. And it was by looking at the light on top of it, they had a certain pattern and look to the ones that that company made. Interesting. Okay, yeah, they design casinos so you can get lost in there. At least that's my belief. So (laughs) that makes a lot of sense. And then the third one I'd like to talk about, it was a client that manufactured certain food products. And so a lot of their inventory was in freezers. So I had to put on a big bulky freezer suit to go into the freezer and count the boxes of the different items. And when I'd come up with a difference, we'd have to go back in the freezer and check it out. And it was very cold, but it was what you had to do. Wow. Yeah, you've had some experiences being in audit. That's, was all this while you were at Grant Thornton? Because I believe a large part of your career there was, was at Grant Thornton. Is that correct? Yes, it was. So I was with Grant Thornton for 10 years. Okay. Sounds like you did quite a bit of travel during that time. It wasn't too much travel. Some of those were local or within an hour or two drive. When you said casinos, of course, the first thing that came to my mind was Vegas. So. <laughs> no, uh, Oklahoma. Well, I wanted to get a little background on this practice fellow position. I'm not that familiar with it myself. And so I'm assuming maybe, you know, people earlier on in their career, you aren't that familiar with that as well. And I was looking online, it looks like it was something you did while you were at Grant Thornton. I mean, how does that work? What is a practice fellow exactly with GASB? And what does that entail even? So I didn't know about the program either until a partner approached me about potentially doing it. So most people don't realize the SASI and the GASB are sister organizations. They're both under a parent organization called the Financial Accounting Foundation. And so they're all three not-for-profit organizations. They're in the same offices, and they are the designated accounting standard setters for U.S. GAAP. And both the SASB and the GASB run this practice fellow program where experienced people from public accounting will come basically be part of the FASB or GASB staff for a two-year rotation. The FASB and the GASB benefit from getting new people with fresh perspectives, recent experience in sort of the real world. The firms that send their fellows get the benefit of having somebody on the inside who really knows what's going on and how the standards are set, how they work, and they can bring that knowledge back to the firm. And of course, the fellow themselves gets to gain all of that knowledge and be part of the standard setting process. Interesting. How do you get selected for something like that? How does that work? For me, it was a partner that I worked with who knew about the program. He was at the time on a committee that was having liaison meetings with the GASB. And so he knew about the program and thought that it would be something that I would be good at and would like to do. And so he pretty much nominated me to go do it. Okay. I would expect for people that want to, you know, make a difference or have been influence, you know, in the profession, that that would be a fun, you know, duty to have. How much of your time during that period do you end up spending with GASB or, you know, doing functions for that as opposed to your regular audit job? It's a full-time commitment. Oh. So I had no audit responsibilities or any responsibilities for Grant Thornton during that time. I was basically contracted out on a full-time basis, you know, worked full-time in the Gatsby's offices in Connecticut. 
Okay. Wow. How do you feel that benefited you personally? And what I mean by personally is personally or career-wise, but as opposed to the firm. Yeah. How do you feel that benefited you, that experience? There are not many people who can say they have been a practice fellow at the GASB or the FASB. And so it puts me into an elite company. I, coming out of there, have a much deeper knowledge, not only of what is written in the GASB standards, but what isn't written in the GASB standards. Also, during that time, as a practice fellow, you do a lot of what I would call reading, writing, and thinking. Whereas in the audit field, you use Excel all the time. You're dealing with a lot of numbers and spreadsheets. At the GASB, I rarely opened Excel. It was Microsoft Word. It was writing and using language and sentences to convey ideas. And so it gave me a chance to develop some different skill sets than maybe I'd been using in the audit field. Okay. It sounds like you really did enjoy that period. Well, just so we don't spend all the career discussion on that, tell us about what you're doing now because you've been or you transitioned to BKD here a few years ago, right? What's your role with them? Correct. So my title here at BKD is the Accounting and Auditing Assistant Director for the Dallas office which is a fancy way of saying I'm kind of the technical quality control person or one of them. So I'm still in the audit practice, but I'm not so much on the front lines of working with clients. I'm doing a lot of the quality control reviews of audits as they come get ready to get issued. I'm also doing a fair amount of training, speaking engagements, writing some of the firm's Thoughtware article. Last week, I presented a webinar on Gazzy's new leases standard. So I'm doing a lot of other things besides just the audit work. Interesting. I didn't realize there was a speaking portion to that kind of role, the quality control. What kind of speaking engagements do you typically do? Are they continuing education related or something else? Yes. It's been a lot of CPE conferences sponsored by different organizations where they're looking for speakers. Okay. Intriguing. Okay. Well, admittedly, obviously, I first found out about you through the article in Today's CPA about your appearance on Jeopardy, and that piqued my interest. I think that's a neat show. (laughs) Um, Let's get into that experience a little bit. And not just the taping and everything, but let's start with the qualification process. How do you get on Jeopardy? What's the qualification process like? So the process starts with an online test that they do maybe once or twice a year. And they say maybe sixty to 80,000 people will take that test. Oh. And from there, about 4,000 people will be invited to an in-person audition. And that's primarily based on your score on the online test. And so you go to the audition, you take another written test, you play a mock game and try to show off your winning personality. And then if you're lucky... Only about 400 people each year will get the call to appear on the show. Wow. How long was it from when you took that online test to when you were on the show? Just ballpark. Curious. So I took the online test in January of 2016. Now, it wasn't the first time I had taken it. I had been through this process a few times before. But the time that it got me on the show, I took the test in January of 2016 I did the in-person audition in New York in October of that year. They called me in December, and I taped in January of 17, and then the shows aired in April of 2017. Oh, my gosh. And do they have some kind of, you know, rules that, you know, that you can't mention the outcome and or, you know, you can't mention that you're on the show or, or something like that in advance? Because that seems like a long time to be keeping a secret. There's a big, long thing you have to sign that includes some of that non-disclosure information. You can tell people you're going to be on the show. They want you to tell people that you're going to be on the show because okay. then that gets people to watch the show. What you can't tell them is if you won the show or if you are going to be on multiple days. So... Even if you win several games, you're on several days, they tell you, you can only tell people, I'm going to be on this first day. And you can't tell them anything beyond that. Okay. So was this sort of a lifelong dream of yours? Or or when did you even start to think about 
getting on Jeopardy. I mean, a lot of people, I'm sure, watch the show. You're, they're interested, but not everybody says, you know what, I'm going to do that. When did you yes. get interested? <laughs> it was definitely a lifelong goal. I don't even remember when I started wanting to be on the show. I know I watched it growing up at various points, and I must have thought, well, I know some of this stuff. I could do that, even though I'm generally not someone to want to be in the spotlight. So it was just a, this is something I want to do, and I'm going to keep trying until I do it. I had been through five auditions before I finally got chosen to be on the show. Five actual auditions or just the test? Five actual auditions. Wow. Okay, you're persistent. Okay. (laughs) The show's staff will tell you, will tell you that at the audition, you know, only about one in 10 who go to the audition will get on the show. And so they tell you, if you don't make it this time, keep trying. Because sometimes the best players, you know, it takes them several iterations before they get chosen. And each time, that means you had to start back with the online test, right? Because you have to... Correct. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Wow. Well, what surprised you once you, you know, got through the process and got on the show? What sort of surprised you about the show that, you know, we as viewers may not know? There are two things that come to mind for that question. One is they're very conscientious. And, you know, they can't, the original Jeopardy came out of a legacy when there were scandals surrounding quiz shows back in the 50s and 60s. And so they're very meticulous about any types of irregularities. There's an attorney present to represent the contestant's interest. You know, we have a big, long briefing before the taping about all of the rules and what to do if you think an answer was ruled incorrectly, things like that. They're very careful to keep everything above board. And the second part is how much luck goes into the outcome of the show. So the show tapes five shows a day. So they tape two weeks worth of shows in two days, taping time frame. And you don't know when you show up to the studio that morning, which show you're going to be on. They just have everyone's name on an index card. And right before each episode, they just pull two names and say, okay, you're up. Wow. And similarly with the questions and answers that they're going to have, the material for the game, it's also, they've got a collection of games put together and they draw one and that's what it is. And you can kind of see this if you're a regular viewer of the show. Some days there's categories you're like, yeah, I know that, I know that, I know that, I know that. And then there's other days and you're going like, huh? (laughs) And so there really is a huge amount of luck involved of between, you know, what material for what game and then who you're going up against. You know, there's a lot of players that given different material, given different opponents, would have had a completely different outcome. And for me, it worked out in my favor a little bit, but it really easily could have gone another way. I wanted to ask you, uh, do you feel like being an accountant helped you in any way on the game show? I mean, did you get, you know, I'll take FASB for 500 or anything like that? (laughs) I wish. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, There's a funny story. There was an episode a few years ago where they had a category called accounting on the show. And it was the last category left because this was to everything else. (laughs) But it was one of those moments when I was watching that going, I'm really glad I was not in that game because I was overthinking the clues, you know, because they're written for a general audience. And I was thinking too technical when one of the answers they were looking for was net worth. And I couldn't come up with what the answer they were trying to get because I'm thinking that net assets, net position, stockholders, equity. Like I was thinking too detailed. Like I knew too much (laughs) for the category. Wow. Yeah, I guess that wouldn't have been good because you would have had to get the show attorney involved and it just, it would have, (laughs) it would have overrun their time budget. (laughs) So, you know, if you, again, if you watch the show regularly, you see a lot of attorneys on the show. You see a lot of writers, see a lot of teachers. You don't really see many 
accountants or other financial people. And I don't know why that is, but I was proud to represent my profession on that national stage. There you go. Are there specific categories you remember that you were thankful came up or that you did well in? Did you get lucky with any of the categories? Not terribly. I was hoping since the weeks that were taping, they tell you the air dates when they're taping the show. It was the week before Easter and the week after Easter that they were taping when I was there. So, and I actually got called for the Thursday before Easter, so Monday, Thursday. So I was hoping that they would have kind of a a religious Bible kind of theme category because of that and did not get that. I was disappointed when classical music came up as a category in one of the shows before I was on. Same thing with a category about David Letterman. Some of the categories I did get were okay, but not my best. Okay. Well, I have to ask you, although really from my standpoint, it doesn't matter. It's just cool that you were on there. But how did you do and would you do it all over again? So I won two games. So I was a two-day champion. I won a little over $24,000, so not too bad. Wow. Uh, The games I did win were kind of a night and day situation. The first game, I played well. I knew a lot of the answers. I won a fair amount of money. The next game, I did pretty poorly. I didn't know a lot of the answers. I got beat on the buzzer by my opponent. I was in a distant third place going into the final, but I knew that the other two contestants having high scores close together would need to bet big in final, which gave me a little bit of a chance if they bet big and missed it. So perhaps here's where being an accountant helped. I was able to do the math in making my final Jeopardy wager. They do give you scratch paper, but no calculator (laughs) to do that. And we ended up all three missing the final, but my score of $1,300 was the highest left on the board. And so that's what I won. (laughs) I love it. I really was going to ask if you whipped out your tin key, but I... (laughs) (laughs) That's why, you know, I was trying to be polite, saying, well, it doesn't matter, and you know, but I have to ask you how you did, because I was worried the way you were saying that, you know, you had difficulty, or not difficulty, but the categories, you know, weren't coming up the way you would have liked them. I thought maybe, you know, that first day was rough, but two days, that's awesome. That's neat. That is neat. Wow. No, I wonder if you made history if you're the only CPA to ever win on Jeopardy. You need to look that up. I know I am not. I know I've seen some others on the show at different points. I did get a Facebook message from somebody who was a CPA in Dallas who had been on, you know, 10, 15 years ago and won a game. Oh, neat. Okay. Okay. Well, I want to be respectful of your time. I know I, you know, told you you'll only take a certain amount of time. And we do have some final questions that I want to get to. But, you know, I'm a novice at the whole game show thing. And so I want to make sure I'm not missing any more important points. Is there anything else that you'd like to share about that whole experience or, you know, qualifying or or being on TV or anything else you'd like to share with the audience? For me, it's a sweet story of persistence. And I'd say maybe the lesson from it, if there is one, is If you have a dream, keep going after it. That's a good lesson. That is. Well, let's go ahead and get to the final question. I end every podcast with the same three questions because I think it gives us some consistency and, and it just gives us a little further insight into your career journey, if you will. First one's usually the easiest. What has been your proudest moment? Well, winning on Jeopardy. (laughs) (laughs) Like I said, it really was kind of the fulfillment of a long time dream just to be on the show and to not make a fool of myself. And the fact that I actually won was a little bit of a cherry on top, but it was so special to have all of my family there who had to fly in from several different states there in the audience supporting me and cheering me on and then celebrating with me after, after the taping was over. Wow. Yeah, that is fun. How long were you out there? Just the two days or? The taping was two days. I went a few days early just 
you know, hadn't really ever been to Los Angeles, but wanted to do some sightseeing and have a little fun if I'm going to go that far. That's a unique family vacation. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Well, if the answer to the second question involves Jeopardy, that's okay. (laughs) Tell us about a mistake you've made and what you learned from it. And frankly, the bigger, the better. We like the big mistakes. Well, I'll go back to my audit career on this one. Okay. So what the listeners of the podcast may or may not realize is as an auditor, sometimes you are engaged to draft a financial statement for your clients. Now, if you're working with SEC public companies, that's strictly prohibited. But when you're working with private entities and not-for-profits, it is permitted. And I had a client who they wanted to draft their own financial statements, and they did except for the cash flow statement. And they were behind. We were getting close to the deadline. And they asked us if we could draft the cash flow statement for them. And so we said yes, and we did it. Well, that client, after that year's audit, their board decided to go out for bid. They found another firm who would do the audit for less. And so they hired this other firm. And so the other firm comes in. They're going through the next year's audit. And then they call us up and say, hey, we're looking at last year's cash flow statement and we we think we see some problems with it. And it turns out we had missed a pretty big number that was in the wrong section of the cash flow statement. In the interest of listeners that are earlier on in their career learning from this, what do you feel the mistake was or what did you learn from the experience? We had gone through the normal, I guess, protocol of preparing the cash flow statement and having somebody review and check it and sign off. And none of us thought about this one requirement. And so there's maybe a couple of lessons. One is I will never forget that provision of a cash flow statement and I'll always be looking for it in future ones. But the other thing is, you know, even the best people can overlook something. And even multiple people, you know, you can look at something, you can review it and still miss something. And so nobody's perfect and no process is perfect. And as auditors, we do a lot of looking at internal controls. And sometimes when there are people involved, they may not work perfectly. That is a good lesson. I appreciate you sharing that because the fact is you're right. None of us are perfect. And sometimes the best teacher is a mistake <laughs> like that. Like you said, you'll never yes. forget you know, yes. that provision. <laughs> I've certainly made some of those in my career. So thank you for sharing that. Well, last question, and then we'll go ahead and close it down. What is the best piece of advice that you have ever received? So I don't have a specific quote or anything, but the idea that we are all made with different personalities, with different skills, different gifts, different abilities. And my set of gifts and abilities and personality may be different from somebody else's, but I shouldn't necessarily compare myself to everyone else. I just need to know who I am, who God created me to be, and to use that in the best way that I can. Not everybody who goes into the accounting profession is going to be suited for, you know, even auditing. And not everybody who goes into auditing is going to be suited for something like the fellowship at the Gassi or the FASI. But I was, and I got to have those experiences and use my strengths and my gifts to do that. I would say to the people listening, you know, find your passion. Even if it's within the accounting profession, there's a lot of different career paths and opportunities. And we need people to go into tax. We need people to go into audit. We need people to work on public company audits. We need people to work on not-for-profit audits. We need people to work on government audits. So find what your passion is and go for it. That is a good point to end all this on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah. I really appreciate it. Well, for our audience, this has been another episode of Life in Accounting, the Where Accounts Go podcast. If you haven't yet visited our home website, please do so. You can find it online at www.whereaccountants.com. 
www.thepowerofpositivityshow.com. We're going to have the show notes for this episode and, of course, every other episode we've done thus far. We also have links to review courses and all the different certifications that you can get in accounting. Once again, that's whereaccountantsgo.com. On that note, Deborah, are there any final thoughts that you'd like to leave the audience with? An accounting degree can take you far in a lot of different directions. And so good luck and go forth. Well said. Thank you again to the audience for joining us. We will see everyone next week. There's more to come.